Coming up. All of a sudden, I hear gunfire. From San Bernardino. <laughs> the site of one of America's deadliest terror attacks. It was literally like as if I was in a movie. One survivor remembers the shootings. And then I just hear a boom, 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 boom. And the man who pulled the trigger. I just remember him telling me, well, it wasn't in our plans. On today's 700 Club. Welcome to this edition of the 700 Club. I'm going to tell you that today one of our featured guests is Princess Maggie, who will be showing some of her uh, <laughs> canine. Uh, isn't, she is. she, isn't she a pretty dog? She is so beautiful. Oh, she's a lovely dog. What kind she's of dog a, is she again? She is a, an Irish water spaniel, and she is just very smart, and she just likes to... But well, we'll have a lot of fun today. So. All right, great. You like dogs? I do. Okay, well, that'll humanize us both. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, he's working hard to win over Christian voters. So Donald Trump met with hundreds of evangelical leaders yesterday. He's going to need that crucial voting bloc to have a real shot at winning the White House. CBN's David Brody was inside that private meeting in New York and brings us this look at what people had to say after it was over. Times Square always hustles and bustles, but just blocks away, the Marriott Marquis Hotel buzzed with activity of another kind, a private meeting between Donald Trump and evangelical leaders. It was a private event, but CBN News was permitted inside to observe. From mega church pastors to longtime stalwarts, they heard Trump speak right, out about defending go. religious liberty, including his desire to get rid of IRS restrictions that muzzle political talk from the pulpit. Trump said a repeal may be, quote, my biggest contribution to Christianity. In that room, among the 900 evangelical leaders or so, there were quite a few that were not for Trump going into the meeting. After the meeting, well, some minds are changing. The ball has moved forward a little bit, and I appreciate Mr. Trump's willingness to reach out to the evangelical community. After hearing him today, I will prayerfully consider it as a possibility in light of the alternative. That alternative is Hillary Clinton. Trump made clear his Supreme Court picks would make them proud, unlike what Clinton might bring to the table. Trump also talked about how evangelicals need to band together because their rights and values are under attack. What pleased some attendees was that Trump didn't appear to make any major mistakes or give reason for pause. I can't remember any time during the several hours this morning that his answer disappointed or there was uh, chagrin about it. Trump's senior advisor Sarah Huckabee also attended and spoke with CBN News. He did something that most Republican nominees in the past have refused to do, and that's walk into this room and be willing to sit down, take their questions, and really interact with them uh, in a very big way. With some evangelicals still wary, the brash outsider will need more outreach. But for now, it seems to be working. As it pertains to the evangelical vote and the candidacy of Donald J. Trump, today's meeting may very well be a tipping point. Pro-family leader Sammy Rodriguez says he knows plenty of pastors who were skeptical before the meeting, but inside something changed. After hearing his commitment, his very well-defined, articulated commitment to religious liberty and life, the Supreme Court especially, I think you saw a number of the same pastors walk out going, that's what I needed to hear. And that's something the Trump campaign needed to hear after a rough few weeks of headlines. It will be important for them to build on any progress here by getting evangelicals to move beyond words and work actively for Trump among their flocks. David Brody, CBN News in New York City. Well, you know, the evangelicals have been one of the most reliable voting blocks. I mean, you know, they used to say organized labor was the organized block for the Democrats. Well, as far as the Republicans go, uh, the evangelicals have been stronger than any other group. And uh, they, they, they stick together w with the party. Sometimes they just don't vote. I mean, that's happened in several elections. Where they, they, but I think this time there's, there's so much at stake. Well, while the evangelicals and Trump were having a little love fest up there in New York, Hillary Clinton was uh, uh, hitting Trump hard on the campaign trail. She was speaking, as I recall, from Columbus, Ohio. And it was one of the most flat 
uh, speeches. There was no uh, uh, drama in it, no uh, pacing. It was just uh, like pablum. And yet she re rehearses and says, what a great job that Obama has done with the uh, economy. And the economy is some of the worst recoveries we've ever had in our history. And uh, uh, the jobless rate is terribly uh, high, the unemployment rate, I should say. And uh, we're looking at uh, 2 to 3 percent, actually not even 3 percent, about 2, 2.5 two percent GDP growth, which is just appallingly low. That's not something to run on or brag about. John Jessup has that story. Pat, Hillary Clinton blasted Trump's economic plans in the key swing state of Ohio, pointing to an analysis that claims they would cost three and a half million American jobs. She's trying to stop Trump from wooing working class voters in battleground states like Ohio, Wisconsin and Michigan. Charlene Aaron has that story. Clinton called Donald Trump's economic policies dangerous and warned that he could bankrupt the country if elected president. In her speech in Columbus, Ohio, Clinton questioned Trump's temperament to guide the economy and repeatedly pointed to his business record, including bankruptcies, as evidence of how he would treat small businesses and working families. Just like he shouldn't have his finger on the button, he shouldn't have his hands on our economy. He's written a lot of books about business. They all seem to end at chapter 11. Trump shot back, it, right? saying he knows how to use debt in business. So what I've done is I've used brilliantly the laws of the country, and not personally, just corporate. And if you look at people like myself that are at the highest levels of business, they used many of them have done it many, many times. And in a tweet, he said, Crooked Hillary refuses to say that she will be raising taxes beyond belief. She will be a disaster for jobs and the economy. But the presumptive Democratic nominee has problems of her own. Russian hackers are believed to have breached the computers of the Clinton Foundation. A hacker using the moniker Guccifer 2.0 leaked documents taken from the Democratic National Convention during a hack last week. Bloomberg News reports the attacks on the foundation's network, along with those of the Democratic Party and Clinton's presidential campaign, add to concerns about her digital security, while the FBI is still investigating her use of a personal email server while she was Secretary of State. And Trump is promising even more of a full assault on Clinton in a speech today. Charlene Aaron, CBN News. Thanks, Charlene. Pat, back to you. I was reading today something that really is appalling. Maybe it came out of that gawker hack, but nevertheless, when Hillary made some of the speeches she made, she got paid about $200,000, $250,000 a speech, some of them as high as five or 600000 Then she said, I've got to have a Gulfstream 4 or better airplane. I've got to have first class tickets for some of my other people to go along. I've got to have uh, a presidential suite in whatever hotel I stay, plus adjoining rooms. And it went down the list. You say, dear me, what kind of demands does this woman make for making one speech? But it's all out there. And the gawker is going to be in the public. But this is incredible. And the amount of money that has come in, she can't attack uh, Trump on account of Wall Street because she is in the pocket of Wall Street. And she and the foundation have guaranteed hundreds of millions of dollars. And it's been pointed out some of them are pretty dicey characters that have given money to the Clinton Foundation. It's going to be a tough one to overcome. And the recent poll indicated that in terms of fixing the economy, that Trump is, you know, way ahead of Hillary on that. They're, they're almost neck and neck in other polls. But in that particular poll, which may be crucial in this election, he, he scores much higher than she does. Now, there's something else that concerns us, and that is the rogue regime in North Korea, Kim Jong-un. And we have allowed them to get away with stuff that they agreed to stop doing. And John has that story, and it should shock every one of us. That's right, Pat. Turning overseas, North Korea has launched two more ballistic missiles. U.S. and South Korean military officials say one failed, but the other, which reportedly flew about 620 miles, was a big step in the regime's development of a powerful missile intended to reach U.S. bases in the Pacific. 
This comes as diplomats from America and North Korea are attending a six-nation security forum in Beijing. U.S. officials say at this point, Pat, there are no plans for talks. You know, they weren't supposed to enrich uranium. They weren't supposed to build up supplies of plutonium. They weren't supposed to have launch uh, delivery vehicles. They weren't supposed to do this, that, and the other. And we have let them get away with all of it, haven't called them on it. But um, the thing that we should be concerned of, we have done something about it. I'm looking forward to having another guest to talk about it. What is called the electronic magnetic pulse, the EMP. First of all, if there is a major solar flare and an EMP that comes out of the sun, it could fry most of the electronic devices in the entire United States of America and maybe throughout the world. However, they have discovered, experts have discovered, that one nuclear device exploded in the stratosphere over the middle part of America could render us close to the Stone Age. It would take out our cars, it would take out our banking, it would take out our food supply, it would take care of almost every type of industry that runs on any type of electronics. And of course, it would render our military uh, almost helpless. This is a major, major thing that we should do. And we're not, instead of worrying about climate change, which may happen in 40 or 50 years or never, we should be dealing with a threat that is right at hand. And all this group of madmen in North Korea have got to do is work a little bit longer on the delivery mechanism. They claim they've got some nuclear bombs and they send one up there and detonate it above somehow in the stratosphere above the landmass of the United States and we are toast. This is a very serious problem and it's one that should be addressed at the highest levels of our government and they shouldn't just address it, they ought to do something about it. Okay, well coming up, the United Nations, and I mean the European Euro Union, has been a disaster, uh, filled with regulation, bureaucracy, waste, and the usual stuff. Now they're being overwhelmed by refugees, and they've got the bailouts. They have to bail out Greece. They have to probably bail out Portugal or Spain. They have to bail out possibly uh, Italy. There are all kinds of weak sisters in the uh, European Union. And the strong countries like Germany and Great Britain and so forth are going to have to pick up the tab. So the British voters are saying, maybe not. And uh, what's been called the Brexit, the uh, British exit, is going to be voted on tomorrow. So here's John with that story. Pat, that's right. British voters will decide tomorrow whether to leave the European Union. If Britain does leave, some fear it could put the future of the entire EU in jeopardy. Dale Hurd has that story from London. To leave or not to leave, that is the question before British voters Thursday. They'll vote on what's being called Brexit, Britain's exit from the European Union. After years of feeling like they were being yanked around by Brussels, the Brits now have a chance to yank the rug out from under the European Union. The Eurozone is a catastrophe. The project doesn't work. I want us to get back our independence. UK Independence Party leader Nigel Farage, one of the leaders in the Leave camp, says the EU has made the British poor, even as the nation has given more authority and control of its borders to Brussels. This is, should be a British passport. It says European Union on it, all right? I think to make this country safer, we need to get back British passports so that we can check anybody else coming in to this country. Under EU rules, Britain cannot limit migration from within Europe. And many Brits feel their tiny island has been overwhelmed by migrants. On the coast, longtime Dover business owner Brian Hall says the town is going down the drain. You know, I've not had a problem with, we've had poles here and hard working and but we've just got too, it's big, the percentage of them in the town is just becoming too much, you know, and it's dragged the town down. We used to be Great Britain, now we're just Britain, so really we should get the great back and sort ourselves out, really, shouldn't we? The Remain side warns that leaving the European Union will be an economic catastrophe for Britain. I think the biggest risk we can take is to pull out of the EU, pull out of the single market, damage our businesses, damage jobs, okay. and there'll be fewer opportunities for our children and grandchildren. But the biggest damage from a Brexit could be to the European Union. 
This German economist called Brexit a nightmare scenario for the markets. He says the markets are afraid of Brexit because that will raise the question of whether the EU will break up. And a happy Europe will be a democratic Europe of sovereign states who are good neighbors in the same street. But a Brexit could cause a political and economic earthquake in the headquarters of the European Union and a domino effect in which other nations leave, possibly triggering a collapse of the European Union. Dale Hurd, CBN News, London. Pat, any predictions on how the Brexit vote will play out? Uh, it's too close to call right now. It's it's right le level. You know the the withdrawal. The the uh, they've got two uh, names. One remain and the other withdraw. But the withdrawal votes were about uh, ten points up. Now it's about even. Do you agree with the Queen that? Brit uh, Britain to get out? Absolutely. I, I, th yeah. I think the uh, European Union has become a bureaucratic nightmare, which is always what happens when you get a bunch of high-paid bureaucrats sitting around tables out of touch with reality, and they make these decrees, and they uh, impose them on all the people of the uh, uh, that uh, union. And it's not working. It's in the United States, and it's not working. If they had something like we had, maybe it would work, but it They'll have to go a long way, but I don't vote in uh, the British election. But if I were, I'd vote to get out because <laughs> right. I'm, I'm 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 an Anglophile at heart, and I think yeah. you know, rural Britannia. Okay, what's next? I, I really feel for them. I like what the yeah. one guy said. We used to, we used to be Great Britain. Now we're just Britain. We need to get the great back. They, I think. Sounds familiar. Amen. <laughs> well, All right. Well, coming up, a look at millennials on the mission field. This generation is the most globally engaged generation we've seen. They're so globally engaged already, I think they're ready to answer the call to missions and to go. Meet two young couples who've answered the call to Peru. Well, you heard about the various generations and the group that we're dealing with right now are called the Millennials. They're the largest generation in America right now. They're also the least churched group in the country. But the negative statistics don't tell the whole story. As our Caitlin Burt shows us why Millennials are traveling out of the United States to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ around the world. Watch this. Each new generation gets measured against their parents and grandparents in a number of areas, including faith. The difference for millennials is that they're growing up in an age of nonstop news and social media. If you are 30 or younger, chances are your belief in God may be on the decline. Have millennials gone godless. A new study shows that young people are abandoning the Bible. According to research, this generation scores low on attending church, praying, and making religion a priority. But it's not all doom and gloom. When it comes to millennials, millions remain deeply committed and active in their faith. It's just they're doing it their own way. And they're uniquely equipped to serve on the mission field. This generation is the most globally engaged generation we've seen. They're the most cross-culturally prepared generation. Many would call them the first global generation. Two out of three of them have passports already by the time they're university students. They're so globally engaged already, I think they're, they're, they're ready to answer the call to missions and to go. Every three years, the Urbana Conference brings together InterVarsity USA and Canada. Students meet and investigate God's call to world evangelization. Urbana 15 director Tom Lynn sees a growing interest in justice and compassion related missions. Millennials care holistically uh, about communities and so not just bringing the message of the gospel or the message of Christ but living it out so it's both word and deed and we're seeing millennials uh, much more interested in committing to these types of holistic mission. Like we make our video in 2014, couples Katie and Jeremy Daggett and Jacqueline and Jake Blair followed their passion for missions to Peru. They fit right in the Christian Urban Development Association, or CUDA, one of the organization's goals being to overcome cycles of poverty. Christian urban development, that, that Christian word at the, on the front end is, is really important. Um, we do all of it because we believe what Jesus did 2,000 years ago is what gives us motive and, and purpose and and really hope uh, in, in this context where we see wealthy and poor in the same city, where we see someone who's doing really, really well, is very established, and then someone who's on the, on the edge of dire poverty. So that, 
really that situation presents some, some unique opportunities and we try to address those with, with CUDA. Jacqueline, Katie, and Jake also put their medical backgrounds to work in a local hospital developing a diabetes program. Jeremy helps teachers improve their reading program success by starting libraries in local schools. One of the things that, you know, that looks like as the kingdom breaks in is that young kids read better and have better opportunities for the rest of their life. That's part for us, that's part of reconciliation for them. And that's part of mission work for us. As all four use their skills to improve life for the Peruvian people, they individually focus on simply building relationships. And when you look at Jesus' life and what he did and how he made disciples, he focused on a few guys and he poured a lot into them. And from there on, they changed the world, just a few guys. So when I think of my call to make disciples, I want to have a quality influence on a few people. And then those people can have a quality influence on a few more people. And then growth is then exponential. And sometimes it means walking down the street, going to the market, uh, running errands, uh, going to the, to the center of town and, and trying to meet people, uh, sharing some of who I am, starting to learn who they are, and eventually moving that forward in terms of, of a uh, sustaining and important relationship. A commitment like this for a young adult brings a number of challenges, from starting over in unfamiliar surroundings to raising children away from family. Being here, we've had to learn a new language and a new culture, and in reality, we feel very ill-equipped to serve the people here. And so, really what happens is, through our weakness, God's strength is shown, um, and when, when things happen for His glory, we know that it's Him and not us. I think one of the main ones is being away from family. Um, luckily, it, we have the technology to FaceTime or Skype with our family as much as we want and get to see them. Now that we have a child and that is our parents' grandchild that we have um, here in Peru away from them, that does make it a little harder as well. Despite the challenges, these couples remain passionate and hope to continue their call to missions. I feel like God's call for us here is the, could be the same call for any Christian in the world, um, and that is to, to be a part of God's mission of blessing people and bringing people to know Him better. Our prayer is for the kingdom to come and for God's will to be done here on earth as it is in heaven. Now we find ourselves in Atiquipa, Peru, so our prayer specifically is for His kingdom to come and His will to be done here in Atiquipa as it's being done in heaven. Caitlin Burke, CBN News, Arequipa, Peru. Arequipa, down in the southern part of Peru. You know, I love Peru. It's just a great country. The Lord has, has got His hand on that country, and I'm, I'm thrilled to see. I just couldn't Caitlin. take my, my eyes off that big snow-capped mountain yeah, in the oh background. Yeah, okay. Well, they've got them down there for <laughs> sure. They've got the Amazon on the one side and the beautiful mountains on the other. Um, I mean, just from a technical standpoint, in case you wondered, there was a so-called iPhone, and that she shot that whole piece on an iPhone she carried with her. She was on that mission trip herself, so that's good. Yeah, iPhones are amazing. Okay. I shot my Kilimanjaro piece on an iPhone. So, yeah, you, know, you okay. can do anything on an iPhone. Well, All right. still ahead, meet the woman who played dead while two terrorists sprayed her workplace with 75 rounds. That's when one of them came by and they kicked me on my leg, my right leg. And then I just hear a boom, 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 boom. And I just knew, I was like, okay, I'm hit. I didn't know if I was going to make it or not. Michelle Saltis tells the miraculous story of her incredible survival. But first, we have a special guest coming up. Pat's dog, Princess Maggie, joins us <laughs> right after this. Well, let's go get the princess. Well, we've got everything on this program. I just want to let you know that we like animals. There's so many pet lovers in this country, and uh, I am one of those. I can train animals. I train dogs, train horses, ride horses, work with dogs. And uh, we have at home a dog that is a uh, Irish water spaniel. Her name is Princess Maggie, and here she is. <laughs> Maggie, all right, sit down, baby. All right, here you go. All right, don't bite me, please. Okay. <laughs> Now she is a, isn't she pretty? She is yes, gorgeous. sweetie. All right, wait a minute. She's so soft. All right, Maggie. All right. All right. You want to sit? There you go. All right. There you go. Okay. Well, 
Yeah, yeah. I'm gonna bribe her a little bit. So All right, buddy. Hot All right, dogs. lie down. They have lie a down. strong Roll smell. Over. She must really love those. There you go. Okay. Wow. All right, sit, sit. Should I shake hands? That's a great. Nice. Good, good girl. All right. Will she shake my hand? Yeah, if you give Maggie, it to her. Maggie, shake. Oh, I guess she no, just I waited for me. Yeah. <laughs> okay. okay, Maggie, shake. <laughs> well, she wants to eat. <laughs> All right, sweetheart. All right, one more time. Lie down. Oh, oh, oh you gonna you, run, right, roll over? Uh, that's a girl. All right, yeah, there. All right, here, Maggie. All right, jump. That's it. All right, jump. Oh, come on, come. <laughs> wow. Right, that's it. Okay. <laughs> You're a sweet dog. Come here. All right. Come on. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Maggie. Will you will you speak for me? All right. Speak. 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 Speak, speak, speak. No, speak. No, speak, speak. She, see, she just, she just, she just she, mouths it. She doesn't. Yeah, she did. She like. She's All not right, barking. Sit. Mm -hmm. There you go. All right. Well, Maggie. How, how old is she now? I think she's about six. She weighs a ton. She she's about. She has the energy of a puppy, though. Yeah, she does. She 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 weighs about seventy pounds. All right, shake hands, buddy. No, 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 no. Shake. No, I didn't say roll over. Come on. <laughs> You got the wrong cue. Come here. All right, shake hands. Good Overachiever. Girl. Come here. Come here. That's okay. Aww. Oh, what there a you go. Okay, that's enough. All right, go on over here. That's it. Go on. Hi, Maggie. Here. All right, go get the treats. Go on. All right. What a, what a fun dog. Isn't she fun? So much fun. She's so smart. She's an indoor or outdoor dog? Uh, uh, outdoor. We never, outdoor. never bring her in. Never bring her in. Never bring her in, right? No, she doesn't like in. She likes out. Yeah. But isn't she fun? So cute. Yeah. I've we, just trained her that. A lot of stuff I should have trained her. I, I, I haven't trained her, you know, to heal like I should. And, and there's certain things that I... You know, I, I haven't had time to do her, but uh, like, I, well, she definitely took direction from you and not from me because well, I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm the man. With You're the, the man. The man who feeds her. Right. Well, we need okay. to transition now into a serious okay. kind of story here. Uh, it's actually an amazing story that began with a terrible tragedy. Until this month's massacre in Orlando, the attack on December 2nd, 2015 in San Bernardino was the worst act of terrorism on American soil since 9-11. 14 people died that day, you'll recall, and by all accounts, a survivor named Michelle Saltis should have been the 15th after she was repeatedly shot at point blank range. Shortly before 11 a.m., the calls came in. Two shooters had opened fire at the Inland Regional Center in San Bernardino, California. A few hours earlier and a few miles north, Michelle Saltis debated calling in sick to work. You know when you wake up sometimes in the morning or you know something's wrong or off or something? That's just kind of how I felt that day. Wasn't feeling the best and stuff, but I was like, well, you know what? I haven't really taken any days off, so I asked my husband, and he's like, well, do whatever you want. And I was like, you know what? It's gonna be a fun day. So I actually ended up getting dressed that day and giving my husband a kiss and said, how do I look? And he's like, you look fine, you look pretty. And I'm like, okay. For the last year, Michelle had been working as an environmental health specialist for the county. And when she first started, one of her trainers was a young man named Saeed Farouk. He was the type of person that was more kept to himself. He didn't really get too involved with anybody. He just seemed distant. I just remember the day I went on a ride along with him, which was when I first started with the county. He was just very inquisitive about my military side with my husband. He had told me he was expecting a baby. And I was like, oh, congratulations. But he was more of like disappointed at the fact. I just remember him telling me, well, it wasn't in our plans. The authorities are still trying to piece together those plans, but here's what they know. On the morning of December 2nd, that baby was dropped off at her grandmother's. And then, at about 8.48 a.m., Saeed arrived at work, sat down a few feet from Michelle. The whole time he was just kind of quiet. The only thing I remember is when he was sitting there, I just remember him looking at a cell phone. He picked it up and he did something to it. And then the next thing I knew, I just remember seeing him stand up and just walk away. What Michelle didn't know is that Saeed left behind a couple bags of explosives. 20 minutes after he left, he returned with his wife, both dressed in tactical gear, 
and armed to the teeth. All of a sudden, I hear gunfire. I look behind me, and I notice that the door had a crack, like it was propped open. And I just see a person standing there. And I saw him lifting a rifle up and start spraying a room from right to left. I just got down on the floor real quick, tried to get out of the way, and just lay there like as if I was dead already, like if he already shot me. I just remember the fire went on for, seemed like forever long to me. The next thing I know is the firing stopped. Saeed and his wife were carrying AR-15 rifles with bullets designed for maximum damage. They fired off 75 rounds before fleeing, but before they left, they paid one more visit to Michelle. That's when one of them came by and they kicked me on my leg, my right leg. And then I just hear a boom, 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 boom. And I just knew I was like, okay, I'm hit. I didn't know if I was gonna make it or not. I just laid there and I just, first thing I did is I turned to God. I start praying. I told him, I said, God, I'm ready. <laughs> I'm ready to go home with you. And, you know, I'm okay with that. I was like, but if it's not my time, I just ask that you protect me, that you shield me, that you keep me safe and keep everybody in here that it's not their time, that keep them safe, protect them. And I just kept talking to him and praying that over and over. I was breathing very heavily at first and I just knew, I said, God, please help me stay calm. I need to stay calm. Lincoln Trigger, be advised that uh, one suspect fled in a black SUV westbound from the location. We do not know if we still have an active shooter. We supposedly have two down inside. We'll be making entry. Within minutes, hundreds of officers were on the scene, but Saeed and his wife were already gone. It's believed at this point they tried and failed to detonate the pipe bombs they left behind. Back at the center, Michelle Saltis tried to move. I have no idea how many people were killed right now. It was literally like as if I was in a movie. Next thing I know, the cops show up. I didn't know who they were at first. I was scared still because I just saw them with a bunch of guns and I was like, oh great, more people in here to shoot us. I just remember hearing them say, if you're injured or hurt and you can walk, let's go. If not, just stay there, we're gonna bring help. And I said to myself, I'm injured. I know it's gonna be hard to walk. I need to get out of here. And I grabbed my purse and I ran out. 15 minutes after the attack, Saeed's wife pledged her allegiance to ISIS on social media. Meanwhile, emergency crews from around the area set up a triage unit for the victims. He looked at me, he's like, you know, oh, sweetheart, you need to get down, you're hit. And he was said it kind of like very nervous. And I looked at him, I said, calm down. <laughs> I said, once I'm down, that's it. I won't be able to get up because I was already losing feeling in my legs and everything. Michelle was rushed to the St. Bernardine Medical Center. Dr. Ruben Osario was on duty. When she arrived, she had a lot of gunshot wounds, eight to 10, maybe a few more in her flank. So after examining her, we determined that she had intra-abdominal injuries and that she needed emergency surgery. I went to shake his hand and Dr. Osario kind of put my hand to the side, he leaned up and kissed me on my forehead and he looked at me and he says, I got this, you'll be okay. And I looked at him and I just remember started to cry and I said, okay, thank you. I knew I was gonna be okay. I know I'm in good hands. I know that God is with me and that God sent them all for me for a reason. Sometime around 3 p.m., a tip led police to Saeed's house. He and his wife fled in a rented SUV ready to make their last stand. Right now we have one down outside the car, one down inside the car. Around that same time, Michelle woke up from surgery and learned the identity of her attackers. Honestly, when I first found out, I get really mad. I'm like, why did he have to do this? But then, I have to stop and I pray and I say, you know what? I have to forgive him because that's what God would do. 
If I were to forgive him, even though I don't like what he did and I don't agree with any of it, it's gonna help me move on with everything in my life. It's gonna help me heal. If I don't, it's just gonna only make things worse. It's gonna make me keep that anger and that hatred and that's not what I want. 14 people died during the San Bernardino shooting. Michelle Saltis was shot point blank. By all accounts, she should have been number 15. The amazing thing is God's grace because when I was in the room, when I was laying there on the floor, when I said that prayer, I literally felt this shield over my body. When he or she shot me, less than three feet away, they missed. And I tell everybody, I'm like, it's because I had God's shield over my body protecting me. He was answering my prayers. He told me, in a sense, it's not my time. He has something better planned for me. Today, Michelle is still under doctor's care. She hopes to return to her job soon. Every now and then, she has flashbacks and sleepless nights. Still, Michelle Saltis is alive and stronger than ever. Before the whole incident, I actually started questioning my faith. I started feeling like it's not enough. But when this happened, without question, I turned to God. It made me realize that my faith wasn't weak. It's even become more stronger since this whole thing. He was with me that morning when I was starting to decide not to go to work. And then when the whole thing started happening, he was by my side and I turned to him right away and I knew God was with me the whole time. His grace is why I'm still here. Wow, incredible story, Pat. I'm mm -hmm. almost speechless. I mean, just that she was able to forgive. Yeah. That they had been co-workers and even driving around together and friends and he'd been her mm -hmm. trainer and then to find out that was the person that would shoot. That, that tried to kill you. Uh, and, and so close, the fact, I mean, that's a miracle, the fact that he missed. I mean, he's right there beside point her. Point blank I mean, range. Yeah. I mean, that's, I guess, point blank range, I'm assuming yeah, is. That's for exactly it. Yeah. I mean, you, you hit and, and they die. Yeah. But uh, thank God, he protects his people. He, lets, yes. he sends the angels to surround us. Well, we want to pray for people, Wendy. I think there are people in this audience, you know, there is so much in this world today. There's so much danger. There's so many things that happen, you know. And with this rise of militant Islam and, and the hatred that is being expressed toward America, uh, we're all uh, at risk. But God Almighty can put a, a shield around us. Mm. Uh, you read the 91st Psalm, it's very clear. Here's somebody, by the way, who uh, Marcia had started having panic attacks. You can understand why people would have it. And one Wednesday morning, she asked God why she was having them. And the same day, Martha heard um, Wendy give a word of knowledge about someone experienced severe panic attacks. Hmm. You didn't know Marcia, I'm okay. presuming. No, okay. Marcia uh, had, uh, had lost her mother a couple of months earlier. Her heart ached for her, especially on Mother's Day. Well, she claimed that word of knowledge. Her panic attacks left, and she is praising God, Wendy. Awesome. Praise the Lord. I've got one here, Pat, too. Mm. Um, for six or seven years, Teresa from Gearheart, Oregon, she dealt with an aggravating skin tag which protruded from her abdomen. Mm. It would get caught on her clothing, and it would become irritated and painful. Then on May 2nd, 2016, not too long ago, she was watching the 700 Club when she heard you give a word of knowledge, Pat, saying there's somebody who's got a bulge. It's a protrusion. It's in your stomach. It's kind of like a balloon that's sticking out. Very specific. God's touching it, and God has completely healed it. Immediately, Teresa claimed the healing. That evening, while visiting with a friend, she realized that tag was no longer painful. She then placed her hand on her stomach, and the tag fell off. Praise the Lord. Uh -oh. Amazing. Folks, I, I'm <clears throat> coming more and more to the realization. You know, I was reading in the Psalms today, and uh, it was saying, you have to stoop down to look at heaven. You have to stoop down. God is so great. We're so small. He is so great. Mm. But these things we ask are nothing for the Lord. I mean, they are nothing for Him. I mean, He, he holds the whole universe together. The heaven and the highest heavens belong to the Lord. The Bible says the earth he's given to the children of men, but he's put us here that we can bless one another. 
And so, Wendy and I want to pray for you. We want to pray for you right now. And I want you to just reach out and realize there is a God in heaven, and with Him all things are possible. Yes, Father, I join with my sister in Christ. I believe God for miracles, you, God. and I know that all things are possible. Stomach cancer has just been healed by the power of God. Lymphoma healed by the power of God. Somebody has t tinnitus uh, ringing in your ear that has just been healed in the name of Jesus. Somebody else with, mm -hmm. uh, you've got a, a problem of uh, a balance. Your, your, uh, mm -hmm. your centers of, of gravity are off in your ear. The Lord has just healed that. Wendy, what do you have? Someone with chronic migraines, God is healing that. He's causing your hormones to come into balance so that those don't keep happening. Also, someone with, um, you've ruptured something in your stomach area from working out. Um, I don't know what it is, but you know what it is, and God is touching you right now. Couple, I believe the names are Mary and Charles. You've been fighting, you're thinking about a divorce. God is saying, no, no, I'm gonna bring you together. He's gonna fill your hearts with love right now. You will have love in your heart, and God will restore your marriage. Now, Lord, for others in this audience that are praying, there's so many in all over the world that are asking for you. Touch them, Lord. Let them see the glory of God in the name of Jesus. Yes. Touch. Yes, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Amen. Amen. And amen. Hallelujah. Give us a call. Tell us what the Lord's done for you. Uh, we'd also love to pray for you. So if you haven't had a specific answer and you want somebody to pray, We've got folks on the phone who love God, they love Jesus, and they love you. So pick up the phone, call in. We're here for you. Wendy? Well, still ahead, a husband loses his job, and his wife worries that they will also lose their home. My life was a train wreck at that point. Losing my home was my biggest fear. I looked for work, and there was just nothing to be had. Here's a financial strategy that saved their home and paved the way to the best job ever. Welcome back to Washington for this CBN News Break. The Illinois State Legislature has approved a bill that gives Muslim Americans a formal voice in the state government. If the governor signs it, Illinois would be the first state in the country to pass such a law. The measure creates a 21-member advisory council of Muslims to give them influence on state policy. The governor and legislative leaders would get to appoint the Muslim council members. The Chicago Tribune reports one Islamic leader who's pushing for the council says it's almost obligatory for all governors to have such a body. An 18-year-old from Indianapolis has been arrested, accused of trying to join ISIS. Authorities raided the home of Akram Musla on Tuesday. They believe he planned to go to Morocco and join ISIS fighters in Libya. The teen faces up to 20 years in prison. Well, you can always get the latest from CBN News by going to our website at CBNNews.com. Pat and Wendy will be back with more of the 700 Club right after this. Radio's Summer of Joy giveaway is now through August 12th, and you could win a trip for two to the Night of Joy in Orlando, Florida. Visit CBNRadio.com for more details and to register. Well, Jackie Benz is not a lot of us. She had a childhood dream of living on a farm. Well, when Jackie got to be an adult, she finally realized that dream, along with her husband, Steve. Then suddenly, Steve lost his job, and their home, and their livelihood were both at risk. Watch this. Jackie and Steve Bentz were excited about their move to Florida in 1996. Steve was starting a new job as a finance manager for a technology company in Tallahassee, and the couple had bought a farm, Jackie's childhood dream. But just shy of a year on the job, Steve was let go. My life was a train wreck at that point. We weren't prepared. You know, as so many people aren't. I looked for work, and there was just nothing to be had. It got really bad. With Steve's unemployment check as their only steady income, the family used credit cards and even started selling possessions to get by. But each month, they got further behind on their mortgage. Losing my home was my biggest fear. And security is really important to me. If other things went, that was one thing, but the house, Losing the house would have been the worst thing. 
Then one evening, Jackie was at a church service when it dawned on her that they hadn't been tithing. And I sensed the Lord impressed me that I needed to make a covenant with him. He impressed me that if I brought my tithe, that he would always make sure my mortgage was paid. Jackie gave that night and convinced Steve they needed to tithe on everything, including his unemployment checks. He admits it took time for him to trust God. I said, God, you want me to give this money today? You show me that I'm supposed to give this money today. And by golly, there'd be something that day. So it was like, yeah, we can, we can trust him on this. They still faced challenges, but were encouraged every time they had the money to pay their mortgage. I'm not sure how God did it. You know, it, it, there was no paycheck. There was no um, specific way to bring in money, but every month it was there. I don't, it's amazing. Steve had been out of work six months when he landed an accounting job at a state college, just before unemployment benefits ran out. Absolutely, I, I know it came from God just because it was, it was too perfect. It's interesting how God makes what looks like a bad situation into a really good situation. But it was because we started paying attention to putting him first. And working at the college opened the door for Steve to get his engineering degree, which led to a higher paying job. The couple paid off their credit card debt and also started giving beyond their tithe. And in 2003, they became CBN partners. You plant the seed where it's gonna grow. And the 700 Club has, they have a proven track record. You know, they're helping people and uh, getting God's word out there. The Bences are still excited about having their farm and are thankful for God's faithfulness. God says, test me in this. And we've tested him and he never fails. He's always there. That to me is, is proof positive. Proof positive. You know, I can't guarantee a farm. I like farms. I like horses. I like cows. I like animals. But I can't guarantee if you give to CBN, you'll get a farm. I cannot guarantee you that. But I can guarantee you that if you give, you'll be blessed by the Lord, because that's what his promise is uh, in Malachi. He said, prove me with your tithes and offerings if I won't open the windows of heaven and pour you out such a blessing you can't contain it. Mm. I've seen that blessing every time I turn around that the Lord blesses one time after another, after another, after another. Uh, you know, I, I, I uh, gave some money uh, some time ago, it wasn't a lot now by today's standards, but to me then it was a lot of money, a thousand dollars. And uh, so I'm, I'm just driving along, and the Lord said, "Ask me for something." I said, "Well, I don't think I need anything." The Lord said, "Ask me." <laughs> I said, "All right, Lord, <laughs> send me something uh, to match up to that thousand dollars." And within a period of a few days or even hours, an, an, an extra thousand showed up, and lo and behold, one of my children had to have dental work, and this paid the dental work. Wow, I love that. Yeah. I love when that, that perfect yeah. timing but, but is just right I said, ask. I said, I don't need mm -hmm. anything. Well, ask, and she'll be done. Um, we want to give you victory over life storms. You know, we'll have storms. There are storms in the way, but God Almighty will look after His people. The Bible says, I've been young, and I'm now old. I've never seen the righteous forsaken or his seed out begging bread. Mm. God will look after his people. So we'll give this to you, Victory Over Life Storms. When you join the 700 Club, it's just 65 cents a day. There's the telephone. Please call in and watch what God's going to do for you. It's an adventure. 1-800-759-0700. Well, some We've, folks are really loving that yeah. DVD. This person, Sylvia from Lubbock, Texas. I love Victory Through Life Storms. I am just so glad to be a CBM partner and I can help other people. Amen, Sylvia, thanks for writing in. We're so glad that that blessed you and All right. we'll be looking forward Let's to more. And take some uh, questions. We got questions. All right, Question. Joseph writes in, I suffered from a pornography addiction for a few years now. I know it's wrong and my parents and pastors have prayed for me and have given me advice. I just can't seem to stop. My mom and I believe that I'm called towards music ministry. How can I fulfill my call if I can't stop? Also, how can you recognize God's voice if you've never heard it? Well, um, you remember the story about Samuel, his little boy, and God called him Samuel, and he thought it was Eli. He said, I'm here. And Eli said, I didn't call you. Went back to sleep, called again. I'm here, you know. Finally, the, the man said, the, the old man said, listen, it's the Lord talking to you. Now, you just say, Lord, here I am, your servant. Tell him what to do. 
Uh, so that that's the whole idea. Uh, God will speak to you. You don't have to spend a lot of time worrying about it. He, he, he'll identify himself. The question is the pornography thing. Look, you've got to get your mind off that stuff. If you look at Victoria's Secret catalogs, if you look at any of the stuff that's on the air today, there are so many movies, so many series having to do with uh, immorality, so much skin out there, so much flesh, so much uh, every time you turn. So Job said, I made a covenant with mine eyes, and I won't look upon a maid. You've got a problem with porn. You've got to get your eyes away from that and start, start reading and studying something of some substance. Start reading the Bible. Start praying and spending your time that way. But as long as that's in your mind, you're thinking about it, and you've got to stop thinking about it. Uh, that's uh, it's a lot more I can say, but we're out of time. We leave you with today's Power Minute from Psalm 69. Uh, he blessed, oh, uh, blessed be the Lord who daily loads us with benefits, the God of our salvation. For Wendy and all of us, this is Pat Robertson, and uh, we'll see you at the 700 Club. Same time, same station. Bye-bye. <laughs>